So we're going to go for about 20 minutes. We'll can part one. The periodic table. Get out your pink periodic table, please. It was first created by Dimitri Mendel, and I want to make sure I spell it right. It's not pronounced Mendeleev, it's pronounced Mendeleev, Russian scientist. He worked on it for a while because he was noticing that certain elements had certain things in common and he was trying to find a way maybe that he could categorize them and he came up with something very similar to what's on, the, what's on your pink periodic table. And here was the brilliance of it. When he put it together, he had gaps. He had stuff that was missing. But he could actually tell other scientists, I'm telling you, there's an element between element number 62 and element number 64. Go find it. And not only could he say that, he could actually say, and you know what, I think it's going to weigh about this much. I think it's going to probably be this color. And in fact, it might even combine with this chemical here if you go find it. It was really a gutsy move. It was really a brilliant move. It allowed us to start to say, oh, it, you know what, it was like arranging something in alphabetical order, but knowing that letters were missing, it allowed us to find missing letters of the alphabet of the universe. So what he did is he arranged the elements uh, he organized the elements based on properties that they had. How explosive or reactive they were, what they looked like, what their mass was, how they combined with other stuff. He tried a bunch of different variations before he tumbled onto the one that you see on your chart. And you don't know why they're all in that order and why they're in those columns, but by the end of this unit, you'll say, oh, that totally makes sense. If I had known that, that's exactly how I would have made it up. So he arranged them into families. Each vertical column is called a family. Some families are going to be important this year. If you look on your pink periodic table, the very, very left-hand side, I think somewhere it tells you the name of those metals. It begins with letter A. Alkali. Okay, the alkali metals, those are all one family. And you know what's cool about the alkali metals? They all explode when you put them in water. And the further down you go, the more they explode until you get to francium, which is kept under lock and key and only governments have access to. Cesium, a university might have access to. I do have a video just recently, super slow motion, of someone dropping cesium in water. I've dropped sodium in water. Now, back when I was in high school, they weren't as fussy about student health, so we got to play with sodium. We actually started a fire accidentally. Now, sadly, sodium is kept a bit more under lock and key. You won't be able to play with it the way I could. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we have some in the chemistry storage room, but it's kept under lock and key uh, in, uh, in oils because it also sodium also will eventually react just with the moisture in the air. Take a while, but drop it into a pool, it'll explode. If you go to YouTube and you type in sodium in pool, you'll see spectacular videos of college kids throwing a bunch into a pool and the pool blows up. Really? Yeah. So that's the alkali family. Next to it, column two also has a name. And it sounds very similar to alkali, but not quite. Okay, alkaline, those are all one family. Then if you go to the very, very, very far right-hand side, the very right-hand column, that one has a name, I think. The noble gases, we'll talk about why they're called the noble gases. Give me one second while I hit pause here. You'll need to know that one, and we'll talk about why they're called the noble gases. And then the one just to the left of the noble gases, the second last column, those are the halogens, right? Those ones are terrifying. Uh, those ones are very toxic. Chlorine is used as a bleach, but it's also used in your, we put a little bit in water because it kills almost everything. So it's good, you know, kills all the germs. Um, fluorine is really toxic. And in fact, chlorine and fluorine, when you hear about them using gas in World War I, some of those were those, they dissolve your lungs and make you cough up blood and burn your skin. Like the stuff you see now in movies, Nerve gas is worse, but we started with that stuff, so they're pretty disgusting. But we'll look at those. Each element has its own box on the periodic table, and there's lots and lots and lots of information in that box, and you will learn what everything means, but we'll kind of wade into it. The first thing, which is pretty obvious, I think in each box there's the element's name and its symbol. Yes? I tend to use symbols because you may have noticed that I tend to abbreviate. 
but whatever. Then we have something that we call the atomic, are you guys okay? Can I abbreviate the word number with a little number sign? The pound sign, is that okay? That's the upper left corner. So right now, can you find oxygen on your periodic table and can you tell me it's atomic number? Eight. It's the eighth element on the periodic table, okay? Turns out that tells you something really, really important. That also tells you the number of protons in an atom. How many protons does every atom of oxygen have? Eight. How many protons does every atom of uh, vanadium have? Vanadium is just a capital V, I think. Find it. It's sort of near the top. 23. 23. If it has 24 protons, it's no longer vanadium. It would be chromium. If it had 22 protons, it would be scandium. Electrons we can muck around with. That does change. And neutrons, when they're radioactive, does change. But I'm telling you, an atom, Evan, is defined by how many protons it has. Yep. Oh, SC is... Oh, sorry, titanium. You're right. I'm reading from the back here. What else? In the bottom row, this is the atomic mass. Look at your periodic table. As you move to the right, what do you notice about the masses? You know what? The further right and further down you go, the heavier the atom. You know, that, that makes sense because it has more protons and protons have mass and it has more neutrons and neutrons have mass. That's why hydrogen is the lightest atom. It's the lightest atom because all it is is one proton and right, one electron. You can't get any simpler than that because if you don't have the proton, you don't have a nucleus, you have no atom. That's why hydrogen is the lightest atom and the, also the most common atom in the universe. It turns out that was the easiest thing to form after the Big Bang. Get a proton, get an electron, you got hydrogen. Bada bing, bada boom. Um, I should say, you may notice that some of the masses have decimals. That's because it's an average mass. The ones that have decimals probably have a radioactive isotope that you didn't know about that also occasionally forms, but not very often. So the, if you notice, oh, how come this one doesn't have a mass of 16, it has a mass of 16.03, that means that some of them are radioactive and it's an average. Question? Yeah. Uh, on one side, have just a question mark? Ah. So one, those are the ones that we're creating in particle accelerators. Those are very recent. We haven't weighed that one yet. And we may have only weighed one version of it, but those ones down there are probably so radioactive that to actually get an average mass might, at this point, be beyond our ability to measure because they decay so fast. Yeah, those are really anything, if you look back there, anything in that gray row at the bottom there, um, that's witchcraft magic. That, that's, you need to have a billion dollar facility and smash some atoms into each other at almost the speed of light, which we can do if you're like several countries. That's even often beyond just one country to build. Good question. What else? This next part is going to become very important. You'll notice there is a number in the top right of each square. A plus sign or a two plus or a minus or a one mi three minus or a two minus. We call this the ion charge and it turns out if you understand that and we're going to spend a lot of time on it you can then predict how atoms combine with other atoms in fact you can explain why atoms combine with other atoms the way they do you can exp explain why it has to be h2o why it can't be h3o or h5o Did I give you that in your notes or not? No. Okay. No. So calcium, atomic number 20. How many protons does calcium have? 20. By the way, you know how many electrons calcium has? Normally 20, but that's what we're going to often muck around with, so that won't always be the case. It has an ion charge of 2 plus. What that tells you is uh, electrons, are they negative or positive? positive? I heard both answers. Which one's right? Positive. Okay. Adam walks into a bar and says to the bartender, I've lost an electron. The bartender says, are you sure? The Adam says, yes, I'm positive. Okay, electrons are negative. Calcium becomes 
two po it loses two negatives. It loses two electrons when it bonds. That's what that tells you. It tells you for calcium to bond with another atom, it needs to get rid of two negatives, two electrons. I realize that says two plus, and that's the tricky part. You have to kind of reverse everything. There's its symbol. There's its name. Most calcium at the average mass is 40.1. Ready? What's its mass? Round that off. What's its mass? 40. How many protons? 40, take away 20, 20 neutrons, because that's the rest of the mass. That's how you can figure out the neutrons. It's this number minus that number, because the electrons basically weigh nothing. Did I say there's a lot of information on the periodic There's a lot of information on the periodic table. You might, by the way, want a calculator for this unit. It doesn't need to be a calculator with anything fancy. It just needs to be able to add and subtract. In fact, if it's like a cheap, free with your bank account calculator, that can work. Or if you're comfortable going two-digit numbers, take away two-digit numbers in your head. In other words, if you can do 83, take away 72 in your head, then you don't need a calculator. But you might want one. The atomic number is the number of protons in all atoms of that type. If the number of protons changed, it would not be the same atom. It would be a different atom. We can do that in a lab. That also can happen when things are radioactive. But most of the time, we're going to assume that's not going to happen because it gets yucky. So all atoms with six protons are what? Have to be. Can I abbreviate carbon with its symbol? And all carbon atoms have to have six protons. You can muck around with the electrons. And in fact, we're now good enough that we can even muck around with the neutrons inside the nucleus. We can, that when you, when you, if you ever hear the term splitting the atom, that's what they were doing in the first atom bombs back in World War II. We can do that now. But the proton, the number of protons is what determines what makes that particular atom what we call it. It's always a whole number. You can't have half a proton. What's the pattern? Do you notice as you move to the right, it goes up by one? Are there any gaps? Are there any missing? No. If you watched Iron Man 2, I like the Iron Man movies, but Iron Man 2 had some bad science because Tony Stark, because he was dying and he had to replace whatever element was in his, he magically found another element on the periodic table that he claimed was missing. No, garbage. There's, there's no room. I'm sorry. There's no room. Further down, maybe, but I'm telling you, anything further down, like in the 120s, would have killed him far faster than anything he was put in his chest for the movie. So Iron Man 2, totally wrong. I have to get that off my chest. Put your pencils down.